Good morning. <laughs> hey, I want to invite you. Let's, uh, let's worship God through the Word of God in Matthew this morning. The Gospel of Matthew. I'll invite you to uh, turn in your Bible there. That'll be our home base of study together here this morning. I wonder if you've ever noticed when you've been studying your Bible that when people encountered Jesus, it created within them an extreme of emotions. And I want to invite you to think about that with me for just a moment. On the one hand, when people first met Jesus, they found him to be incredibly compelling. They found him to be, in fact, incredibly interesting. And they hung on every word that he spoke and they watched everything that he did. He was incredibly interesting. But on the other hand, and at the very same time, the very same people, also, when they were around Jesus, are you listening, they felt really, really awful about themselves. Because the more they were around Jesus, the more it exposed their own flaws as they were near him. And so Jesus was always bringing out these extremes of emotion within people that he met. Back when I was in grade school, uh, my mama had this idea that she was going to uh, make sure that I took saxophone lessons. I thought that was pretty cool. I I think the saxophone is a pretty cool instrument. And I I remember going to to take lessons, and I remember having absolutely no idea what I was doing. And I remember sitting there and watching, there were a couple of the students and the instructor himself, they were very, very, very skilled at playing the saxophone. And I remember watching them and listening to them and thinking to myself, they're really, really good. And that's the sound that I want to kind of aspire to. But at the same time as I watched how good they were, it also made me feel really bad about myself because I realized I'm nowhere near their level. And there was a little bit of that going on when people encounter Jesus. You know this in your own life when you meet somebody who's really, really, really handsome. Or you meet somebody who's really, really, really beautiful. Or you meet somebody who in some phase of life, they're really, really, really skilled. On the one hand, you think, man, that is incredibly interesting. They're good at that. But on the other hand, you think, man, that kind of exposes my own flaws as well. And so I just ask you, how much more true would that be to be in the presence of the holiness of Jesus? To see how interesting and how compelling he actually is. But at the same time, the more time you spend with him, the more you realize your own flaws. And so you can feel awful at the same time as being interesting. And and over the years, people have recognized this. And I want to just say to you, and it's a very sad, sad situation. But there have been a lot of people who've recognized that Jesus is incredibly challenging in Scripture. And so what they've ended up doing is they've sort of dumbed down the message of Jesus, or they've oversimplified the idea of Jesus, so that the message of Jesus has become something like this. Follow Jesus, and you'll have health, and you'll have wealth, and Jesus will make sure that your lives are comfortable. Let me tell you something. All you got to do is turn on your television, and you will see people who preach that particular message each and every Sunday. Because they've seen that the challenge of Jesus, being in His presence, it can bring about extreme emotions. So they've softened that quite a bit. And for people in, in the world who are seeking something, they're seeking answers for their lives, when they encounter, are you listening, when they encounter these false ideas of Jesus, for them, that kind of idea sort of jumps the shark. Anybody know what I mean by the phrase, jumping the shark? So when I was a kid, I used to watch this reruns of this show. I thought it was a great show, called Happy Days. Happy Days was awesome. Happy Days was one of the most popular TV shows of all time. And one of the main reasons that Happy Days was popular was because the guy in the leather jacket. That is, what? That's a Fonz. That's Fonzie. And Fonzie is cool, right? Fonzie's super cool. But as the seasons went on in Happy Days, they started kind of, you know, losing traction and losing momentum, and they didn't know how to keep the ratings up and keep the popularity up. So there came a season and a couple of episodes where for some inexplicable reason, they had Fonzie jump a shark in the middle of a lake. 
I don't know why he jumped the shark. It was kind of in the middle of that Jaws craze, okay? But for whatever reason, from that moment on, the show lost credibility, it lost momentum, and people just it kind of coined a phrase in our society. They said, the show has jumped the shark. It's lost all credibility. And let me tell you about these false views of Jesus. For people out in the world that are searching for answers for their lives, they see these fake and dumbed down and oversimplified and fake messages of Jesus. And for them, that form of Christianity has sort of jumped the shark. It has no credibility. It doesn't work for them. And so what I'm saying is we need to get back to the biblical Jesus. We need to get back to what the Bible actually has to say about who he was and the message that he brings and the answers that he offers for our lives. So what we're doing this month in the month of February is we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called The Adventure of Discipleship. And today I want to talk about the main message that Jesus preached. And where we're going to go in this particular series, we're going to talk today about the main message of Jesus. Next Sunday, Jesus is going to tell us from his own lips the type of person he absolutely cherishes. The kind of person that Jesus loves beyond measure. And in the last lesson in this series, we're actually going to try to take a crack at looking at nearly every command that Jesus gave. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to know the kinds of things followers of Jesus do. This is really Discipleship 101. It's the very basics of what it means to follow Jesus. And so we're going to remind ourselves of that very first message that the Bible presents for us. Okay, so you're in the book of Matthew, right? All right, so just to kind of catch us up in context, the book of Matthew starts out in chapter 1 with a strange genealogy, and you've kind of read over it before and wondered why is that there. Well, it's there because, are you listening? It connects Jesus to the whole history of the Old Testament. It's really kind of cool. And moving on from there, you get into chapter 2, and Jesus is baptized as a means of obeying the heavenly Father. He has a unique baptism in the history of baptisms. No other baptism is ever like that. And we hear the words from God himself from heaven. This is my what? My beloved son. And from there, Jesus is driven into the wilderness of temptation for 40 days. And he actually conquers evil and the devil while he's in this wilderness wandering. So you're looking in your Bible, and now we're coming out on the other side of the temptation. And now we see Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. When he heard that John had been arrested, Jesus withdrew into Galilee, verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, where verse 15, the land of Zebulun and The land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light is dawn. All right, you ready? Jesus is about to preach his very first words in his ministry. And it will be his main message that he preaches throughout his preaching ministry. What will that message be? Are you ready? We're on tiptoes of expectation. Here we go, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In verse 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. All right, put your mind in a time machine for a moment. I want to, I want to take all of us back to the first century. And I want, to, I want you to imagine for a moment that you are a first century Jew. And I want you to imagine that if you're living at this particular time and you're, you are a fisherman, your family, your, your family, that's your family business, your family of fishermen, and you're very aware that as you're living your everyday life, Your home nation is in military occupation by a foreign power. Just imagine what that would be like. 
waking up every day. You're the people of God. You've got all the history of God working in your life. And as you kind of live life and walk from one place to the other, day by day, you can see off in the distance, you can see the temple of God standing over there. And you know all the promises that God has made for you. But you know that also the people are being ruled by corrupt leaders. Paganism is everywhere. There's corruption all over the place. And you're hoping and praying every day for a new kingdom, a new regime to come into place to rescue you from that. And so just imagine walking down the street in your hometown and on every big street corner there's a Roman militarized checkpoint checking out who you are and what your business is. This is everyday life for them. And for a lot of those families, what you're having to do is you're having to sell your ancestral lands in order to pay the heavy taxes that the Romans were levying on you as a people. Imagine that setting. It's very, very difficult. Now you as, you're in the business of, of fishermen. You work on the Sea of Galilee. You're doing pretty good. You're not as poor as some. But the truth of the matter is, you know, things are not as they should be. But you get this rumor in your ear. You start hearing buzz about this new prophet, Yeshua, Yeshua Menazareth from Nazareth. And this prophet, he is drawing lots of crowds to himself. He's dynamic. Everybody that meets him finds him incredibly interesting and compelling, and a lot of people are really, really bothered by him at the same time. And you get the news he's coming to your home synagogue in your hometown, and you want to go hear him. And imagine you go in and you're listening to Jesus preach. My question to you, what would you hear him preach about the most or first? For a lot of people, they'd miss this completely. The message of the kingdom of heaven, I want you to listen to me, in the book of Matthew is found one and a half times on every page in the book of Matthew. It's found 50 times in roughly about 30 pages in the gospel of Matthew. What you would hear him preach about more than anything else is found in your chapter 4, verse 17. It's kind of the umbrella lesson where all the details are preached about, but it's under the banner of this message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now you've been waiting your whole life to hear about a new kingdom. This message would be life-shaking, would it not? I'd be really interested in this. So I want to suggest to you, I want to, if you've got an outline, a bulletin this morning, I want to invite you to open up in your bulletin and follow along because I want us to take four really, really important ideas from what Jesus preached about mainly in his life. We're going down to the very, very basics, the foundation, the building blocks. And I want us to apply this to ourselves, make it very, very basic, but to see what he's saying. You ready for this? Write it down at number one. This message from Jesus means a new king guiding your life. It means that there is a new king who has arrived to guide my life and to guide your life. A king who is perfectly qualified to guide your life perfectly. To guide your life in the way God intends. There's a new king on the scene to guide you. Now, when you look in those verse, that verse 17 of chapter 4, and you see the words of Jesus where it says, Repent for the what? The what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's meant by the word kingdom here? If you were to go back into the Old Testament, you'd find a particular word, Memlakats, found 117 times. It's the word that they use for kingdom. And it's a word that means, in fact, dominion or rulership. Over in the New Testament, you find the word basileia. Basileia is the word for kingdom, and it's found about 117 times. And it also carries this idea of a rulership. If we just kind of summarize it, the word kingdom in this context means reign. It's the reign of King Jesus in your life. It's the reign of King Jesus in my life. This is what's meant here, just to summarize. 
Now, I want to take you all the way back to the beginning of the Bible for just a minute. Y'all got two, two minutes you can give me for this? And I want us to think about, just kind of trace this idea of God sending a king into the world, the perfect king to guide our lives. Back in the Old Testament, if you go to the book of Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, He created Adam, and God's the king, but He sets up Adam kind of have, to have a, a co-rulership and to have dominion over everything that was created. But you know the story. You know that Adam and Eve rebelled against that leadership. And they were excommunicated from the garden. And, and so, in fact, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 11, there is a new kingdom in the world, and it's called Babel. It's the roots and seeds of the kingdom of Babylon. And I want you just to, just, can, you, can we just pause here, and can I get your attention to help you to think about what's being, the picture being painted? We started out with a perfect, harm, a harmonious you know, setup between God and man, and now by the time we get to Genesis chapter 11, there are two kingdoms. And one of them is a rebellious kingdom set up by men. So here's the deal. If you've ever asked the question, why is the world so messed up? This is the answer. Human beings have set up their own opposing kingdom to the rule of God. And so what God does in reaction to that is He finds a group of people and He sets them aside and He's going to use this group of people. In fact, He makes up His mind He's going to rescue these people from Egyptian bondage and through them He's going to bring a perfect king who would solve all of the main, and main issues in people's lives. And so we have... God rescuing the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. And what does it look like, by the way, when God comes to rule His people? Well, He defeats evil. He conquers everything that's wrong. And He defeats human kingdoms as He invites people to live under His reign. And from there, they travel to the mountain, a base, the base of a mountain where God issues forth some laws that He's going to give to the people to follow in His newly set up kingship. Now I want to just uh, pause here and ask you, did the people do really well at keeping these laws? Did they do well? Did they do poorly? Did they really, really, really poorly? And so what God prophesies then is in Daniel 7, he prophesies that there will come a day when God will send the perfect king into the world who will have an everlasting dominion. Everything about his kingship will go on and on and on forever. And so if you're living in the first century, you're singing songs about this. You're meeting in the synagogue, waiting for this new king to arrive to guide your life perfectly. Can we time out for a second? This isn't a message just for three, you know, 2,000 years ago. This is a message for us. I went through that biblical portrait just for a moment to just show you how far your God has gone to create a beautiful people unto himself that he wants you to be part of. So, this message means a new king guiding my life. But notice, secondly, it also means, if you've got a new king guiding your life, it also means giving up your own control. Because, on the one hand... If you have a new king who's arrived, he's going to guide your life, he is perfectly qualified to do so. Let me just ask you a question. In comparison, how qualified are we to guide our own lives versus Jesus? So this new kingdom, it means a new king. And I want to just pause right here, and I want to give you kind of a biblical portrait of who this new king really is. On the one hand, he is completely human but on the other hand, Colossians 2.9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He is equal with God, Philippians 2.6. He is one with the Father, John 10.30. He preexisted with the Father, John 17.5. He is called God in Scripture. In fact, Thomas looks up at him and says, My Lord and my God, when Jesus is resurrected. And he's even called by God the Father, God, in Hebrews chapter 1. So, this is the true portrait of who this arriving King Jesus actually is in His true being. 
So on the one hand, we have the arrival of this perfect king and his perfect kingdom. On the other hand, there's an opposing kingdom. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says, God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. All right, time out. Are you listening? This text is saying there are two kingdoms in this world. Only two options. You are in one kingdom, the kingdom of the world, or you are in the other kingdom, the kingdom of God's dear Son. There's no in-between. To make no choice is to make a choice. You're in one or the other, whether you realize that or not. I, I would hope that we strive to be in the kingdom of this newly arrived, perfectly qualified king to guide our lives. That means giving up a little bit of our own self-control in trying to guide our own lives. Can I just, can we pause a moment? Please don't answer this question out loud. How, how good are you right now at guiding your own life on your own? I mean, just think about the history of your choices. Have you made all the right choices? <laughs> Years ago, I was in school and uh, I was studying psychology and I came across a book, very a uh, highly uh, peer-reviewed book called Galen's Prophecies by a, I think, top 25 most influential psychologists of all time, a guy by the name of Jerome Kagan. And Dr. Kagan had this idea that he proposed in the book. He says, every human being is neurochemically born with a predisposed personality. You ever notice that in your children? You ever notice you have one child... Then you have the second child, maybe a year or two later, and you raise them exactly the same, but man, they grow up with completely different personalities. You ever notice that, that that can be a possibility? Kagan says we're sort of hardwired with one type of personality or the other, and he says there are essentially three major personality types, which he labels as anxious, aggressive, and philosophical. So you're, you're really, really worried, you're really, really aggressive, or you're really, really thoughtful. And he says each of these personality types are really good at some things in life and really, really bad at other things in life. Now, time out. Let's say you are born with one of these personality types. That means, are you listening? I'm going somewhere with this. That means you're really, really, really good at handling one-third of the life issues you're going to come across, and you're going to be really, really, really bad at handling two-thirds <laughs> of the issues that will come across your life. Are you getting the message? That's challenging. I, that bothers me. I want to be in better control than that. But the history of my choices shows in my own life that I don't always make the right choice. That sometimes I make the wrong choice. That I'm not the best at guiding my own life. If I did not have the Lord's direction in my life, I would make a tremendous mess out of things. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that the arrival of King Jesus as the new and perfect God for your life also means that you have to give that position over to Him and not try to be the God without Him. So what does it mean to live in, under the reign of King Jesus? It means He kind of comes along and exposes the flaws, the false kingdoms we create in our lives. Maybe that makes us feel awful, but it's what we need. So this message in Matthew 4.17 is a message about God coming and rescuing His world, and in fact, rescuing us. And He's not done with this yet. You look out at the world and you say, well, it's, you know, it's not perfect. Listen, not everything is as it should be yet. Jesus is still working, but rest assured, He will fix everything. We're headed to that day. But this is an invitation to following a new king. So this message, I think, number one, very basically, it means that a new king is here to guide your life. It also means that you have to give up your own control, follow his lead. And thirdly, it means, this message means living with new mission and new purpose. And I want to I kind of chase this down in the text for just a moment. Never again are you going to... You know, kind of think about your life. Why am I here? Why has God created me? Let, me? let me tell you why God has created you. In the book of Colossians, chapter 1, 
Paul is writing and he says, For by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. That means you. You were created for Jesus. To love Him and to cherish Him. To enjoy who He is. To bask in His love just like today. Thankfully to God, we can go outside and just allow the sun's rays to wash over us. And that's how we feel enjoying the love that Jesus showers upon us. That's why you were made. Back in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 43, verse 7, God says, draw all of my people to myself. Those whom I created, why? I created for my glory. You were put on planet earth to enjoy God forever. To be happy in God forever. That's why you're here. So whatever else you might say about the purpose for your life, these things are true. They're the, kind of the overarching purposes to all of our lives. Now watch Jesus invest in some people some purpose. Go back to your text in Matthew 4. From that time... Verse 17, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 18, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and what? I will make you fishers of men. Jesus takes these men, and he invests in their lives a new meaning and a new purpose that they didn't have before then. And I want to suggest to you, He wants to do the exact same thing with my life and with your life. He wants to invest in your life a meaning and a purpose for your every day that maybe you haven't realized you needed. That's who Jesus is. Now, as you follow Jesus, what are you going to discover? We talked about it at the beginning. What are you going to discover? On the one hand, you're going to say, man, He is really, really compelling and interesting. But while you're following, you're also going to say, man, I feel really bad about myself. Because, I mean, how can you follow perfect love and not realize sometimes we're really self-centered? And so what does Jesus do? He says, follow me. No longer feel that way because you have entered into my grace. Follow me. He's going to invest in you a new meaning and a new purpose. So are you listening? Here we are. We have a long-awaited king who brings a long-awaited kingdom and he invites you to be a part of that kingdom and invest within your life a meaning and a purpose it does not have without it. But there's a fourth thing I want you to notice. Not only is this message a message about a new king guiding your life and a message that you need to give up that control to him, And not only is it a message that now your life will have meaning and purpose, but the fourth thing is this. This message really means that you must absolutely, are you listening? Absolutely dedicate your life to the teaching and the example of Jesus. That every single day, your thought is, What does Jesus say, and how did Jesus live, and how can I mirror that in my own life? That's what it means to follow Jesus. So, pick pick, pick the text back up. Notice again, verse 19, he says to them, follow me. That's the call that Jesus gives to those who would be his disciples. A disciple, a mathetes, is a learner. Very, Very basically, it just means a learner. And what that practically means, are you listening? It means that you know Jesus, that you absolutely internalize His teachings. In fact, you memorize as much of the teaching of Jesus as you can. And then, is that enough? No. Then you go out and you start to live it. You live it out. This is what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. So, back to our text, beginning in verse 21, we'll finish it out. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father. 
mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee. Watch what he does. Teaching in their synagogues. Proclaiming the gospel of what? The kingdom. And healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And if you're following Jesus, guess what things you're also going to engage in? You're going to teach. You're going to proclaim. You're going to find people who are hurting. And you're going to minister to them. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So the expectations that Jesus places on you are these. To seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew 7. To pray always. And the promise is that even if you give someone a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, you will not lose your reward. He wants to invest that purpose in your life as you follow him on this narrow pathway. Now that makes sense if you've got a new king and you want to follow him. Why would you ever not do what he guides you to do? Jesus might look at some of us and say in the words of Luke chapter 6, why do you call me your Lord and do not do the things that, we, that I say? That's a very powerful message for us to think about. So from here, and this is kind of where we'll end up going the rest of the month, from here, after this that we just read about, Jesus is now going to ascend a mountain, and he's going to start telling people about what his kingdom is going to look like. And he's going to tell us next, about the kinds of people that he absolutely cherishes. I want to be one of those people. I think maybe you do too. So we're going we're gonna to look at that. So today, what does it mean to live under the reign of King Jesus? It means that he exposes our own kingdoms and our own failures. He has come to perfectly reign in our hearts and lives. And in the process of all this, he's conquering evil. And he's inviting us to be a part of all of these things. I wonder if you'd consider that. Let's pray about it. Father, we come before you this morning. We are absolutely humbled and thankful for what you've done for us. It's truly amazing to think about all the work that you have put into place to extend your grace to us. And today, we bask in the love that you have given us through your Son. An immeasurable love, an infinite love that has been shown to us through the shedding of your Son's blood. Father, may we take this invitation and challenge to follow your Son very, very, very seriously today. Let us never soften that message or whittle it down, or change it. May we be faithful and true to it. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. In Colossians 1, Paul says, God has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. You're either in one kingdom or the other. There are only two options. The kingdom of the world or the kingdom of Jesus. Can, I, can we pause for a moment? Can I just say to you, you are, you are flawed. I am too. We are so flawed that the only thing that could fix it was Jesus coming and sacrificing for us to take all the penalties of all of our wrong. But you're also so loved that Jesus did that willingly and gladly for you. How will you respond? Stand and sing.